in this lesson, we are looking at a few of the security best practices that you can incorporate as a solidity developer while writing your contracts. So how we will do this is by looking at various forms of attacks that ha that could potentially happen to your solidity smart contract and then looking at some of the measures to overcome or rather avoid those attacks. The first attack that we are going to be looking at is a very popular attack called re-entrancy attack. It's an older form of attack and it's not super popular right now, but there have been huge losses, especially in known products like Uniswap due to this re-entrancy attack. So what is a re-entrancy attack? A re-entrancy attack is when a particular contract A calls a contract B and the contract B is actually an untrusted contract. And it leads to drainage of your funds due to this call. Now, this exploit allows the contract B to call back into A before A finishes execution, right? So, while A is doing, doing some steps for properly executing, before those steps are executed, contract B calls contract A and it tries to create an exploit and withdraw the funds. As you can see in this diagram, you have contract A, which is undergoing some processes like check balance, send funds, and then update the balance. Before this, during this process of one of these, there is a cross contract call that happens to contract B somehow, which has a function that calls back into contract A before it updates the balance and draws the funds from this particular contract. Now, before we look at the preventative techniques, let's look at the contract itself and how this re-entrancy error can happen. Most of the contracts that you will be seeing in this lesson are from Solidity by example. So credits to them, this amazing team that created all of these sample codes for us. In this particular contract called Ether Store you can deposit and withdraw ETH. Now, this contract is vulnerable to re entrancy attack. Let's see why. Because you can deploy Ether store. You can deposit one Ether, each from, say, account one belonging to Alice and account two belonging to Bob into Ether store. You can see there's a deposit function, right, which is a payable function. Now, you can call the deploy attack with the address of ether store basically you can see that there is an attack right you can deploy this attack contract with the address of your ether store that you have already deployed and then you can call the attack function that is present in this attack contract that is here right which is a payable function you can call this by sending say one ether by using another third party account when you do this, you will get three ethers back. That is the two ethers stolen from Alice and Bob plus one ether sent from this contract. Right? So what you're doing is, let's again look at the attack. We have the attack contract, which is deployed using the ether store contracts address. Right? Now here, what you're doing is, you, when you call the attack, you are sending one ether. But within this, you're calling the ether store contract and you're calling the deposit function which is having by sending value one ether, right? So you are basically calling this by sending one ether. And then when you call withdraw, that is ether store dot withdraw, what they are saying is that you can withdraw the entire balance that is present in this contract, that is by, which is also being sent by Alice and Bob, right? Now let's see how this particular attack happens, right? What happens here was that attack was able to call etherstore.withdraw, this function, multiple times before etherstore.withdraw finished executing. Here is how the functions were called. First, you call the attack and then you call etherstore.deposit. Then you call the withdraw where you get the attack fallback, right, which receives one ether. And then you again call withdraw, 
which your fallback function in the attack receives one ether. And then you call the last withdraw where your fallback function receives one ether, right? Let's take a look at this quick fallback function, okay? Now, whenever you are, whenever you are sending e ethers to this particular contract, right? Whenever, what is a fallback function? Whenever you receive ether to a particular contract, and if you don't have a specific function that you're calling, right, to send that ether to that contract, it calls a fallback function. Now, what is this fall? So, everything that the attack that is happening is actually associated with how this fallback function is written. Now, what this fallback function says is that it checks if the address, that is the balance of this ether store contract, that is the main contract, is greater than or equal to one ether, then withdraw. Right? So, it's calling the withdraw from here. Once it calls withdraw. Again, is go it goes through the withdraw function. It will withdraw one ether that is through here, message sender dot call, right? It is sending the balance. So, it will withdraw one ether into this. Then again, it sees that the balance of ether store is still greater than one ether. So, as a recursive function, it withdraws one ether again. Once the balance becomes zero, then this function stops getting called. But how is it, what could be the fix that could potentially make sure that you are not able to call this withdraw function again and again and again, right? Of course, there could be multiple checks over here. One is that the moment you are making a call to this withdraw function, you are checking the balance of this message dot sender right so you are re you require that the balance be greater than zero once the balance is greater than zero it is calling it's be it's basically making a message dot sender dot call and then it is sending the value balance which is withdrawing the balance of that particular account right now the updated balance of that message dot sender is actually updated only after this withdraw happens, right? So, can you see the flaw here that whenever you're trying to make a withdraw call, you're trying to make this withdraw call that is sending ether to this message sender, that is the attack contract in our context, right? The moment ether is sent to this, it again calls the withdraw, right? And then the moment ether is sent to this, again calls the withdraw. So, it's not reaching line 42 unless this recursive call has been made. So, one of the best ways to prevent this is to update the state of variable before making a cross contract call. So, here you're making a cross contract call, right? To the message dot sender, which is the attack contract. And before making the cross contract call, if you actually update this balance, that is, now that message dot sender has withdrawn their balance, the balance of their account is actually zero. This check will automatically fail, right? When they try to get the balance of that particular user, right? This check will automatically fail. Sorry, this check will fail here, right? Because ether store still has balance, so this check will pass. But when you go to withdraw, you would try to get the balance of the user. It would have already become zero because you would have put this condition in line number 38 instead of putting in line number 42. And this can be one of the fixes. This is one of the fixes to ensure that you don't get into a re-entrancy attack, right? That is, you make a call to an untrusted smart contact like this one. Right, while you are basically just sending the money, they are just trying to withdraw the money that they sent, right, from their account. And you are basically just trying to make a call to this. However, this fallback function is actually malicious and it keeps calling the, the withdraw function. So, one of the preventative techniques for this is to be able to make sure that all the state changes are happening before calling external contracts. And the other way to do it is you can use function modifiers that prevent re-entrancy. So, there is a modifier called re-entrancy guard. Actually, the, these are uh, 
there is a module itself that you can import from open zeppelin called reentrancy guard and from reentrancy guard you can add the non reentrant modifier to your function which will make sure that there are no nested reentrant calls to that particular function so these are some simple fixes and i would suggest you to take a look at the fix that is there as a part of the solidity by example as well and try it out as an exercise for yourself